you know, I'm having um, a feedback. Yeah, you are. It's because dad's mic is not muted. Yeah, I'll mute him. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So we want to thank the whole BLA board for making our event possible and Herb Fierro for his leadership. Francine Whitney is our Zoom host today and we can thank her technical expertise for making today's presentation possible. We have an exciting lineup of presenters representing art forms as diverse as the written word, the visual arts, and maybe even the musical arts. So let's begin. Our first presenter is Francine Whitney. Okay, so is everybody, just one more technical thing, is everybody able to go to speaker view um, and out of gallery view? You don't have to, but it, you'll be able to see the person better. Okay then, I'm gonna take that as a yes. So, yes, I am actually the musical person. I'm sorry that Valerie isn't, but Valerie has inspired me to, uh, to do something musically. And uh, so I'm gonna back up so that you can see my ukulele. Is that, uh, can everybody see that? And let's see. I don't think Lisa, I don't think you're muted. Oh, now you are, okay, all right, all right. Okay, so, um, so yeah, one of the things that I did during the pandemic to pass the time is I learned, uh, I, I practiced my ukulele, so, so here goes nothing. Uh, I'm gonna try to see so you can, all right. Try to be chill, but you're so hot that I melted. I fell right through the cracks. And now I'm trying to get back before the cool done run out. I'll be giving it my best test, and nothing's gonna stop me but divine intervention. I reckon it's again my turn to win some or learn some, but I won't hesitate. No more, no more, it cannot wait. I'm yours, well open up your mind and see he like me. Open up your dance and damn you're free. Look into your heart and you'll find love, 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 love. Listen to the music of the moment people dance and sing. We're just one big family, and it's your God forsaken right to be love, 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 love. So I won't hesitate no more, no more. It cannot break. I'm sure there's no need to.
Thank you. Nothing like silent applause. <laughs> okay, so uh, our next presenter. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I, I'm oh. not done. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hang on, I worked for this. Okay, so I actually have three songs. I hope that's not too long. No, not at all. I okay. didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. So, um, so this one, I don't, you know, this is one Ramesh probably knows the more correct words to this than, than I do, but this is John Prine who, uh, you know, he died this year. He was a really great singer songwriter. This isn't typical of him, but. Well, I packed my bags and bought myself a ticket for the land of the tall palm tree. Aloha, old Milwaukee. Hello, Waikiki. I just stepped down from the airplane when I thought I heard him say, Waka waka nuka nuka, waka waka nuka nuka, would you like a lay? -a? So let's talk dirty in Hawaiian, whisper in my ear, kick the puka maka mawahini, are the words I long to hear. Lay your coconut on my tiki. What the heck, a mooka mooka dear? Let's talk dirty in Hawaiian. Say the words I long to hear. It's a ukulele, Honolulu sunset. Listen to the grass skirts sway. Drinking rum from a pineapple out of Honolulu Bay. The steel guitars are all playing while he's talking with his hands. Gimme, gimme, yoka doka, make a wish and want a polka. Words I understand. Well, I bought a lot of junk with my moolah and sent it to the folks back home. I never had the chance to dance the hula. Well, I guess I should have known when you start talking to the sweet Mahini. Walking in the pale moonlight. Oka doka naka raka, can you do the sis pumbaka? Hope I said it right. So let's talk dirty in Hawaiian. Whisper in my ear. Kick a puka maka wawahini. Are the words I long to hear? Lay your coconut on my tiki. What the heck, a mooka mooka dear? Let's talk dirty in Hawaiian. Say the words I long to hear. I said, let's talk dirty in Hawaiian. Say the words I long to hear. Aloha. Uh. I almost feel like in this age, it's not especially correct to even make fun of native indigenous languages, but nevertheless. Okay, here's my last one. You all know this. <clears throat> when you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. Upon a 
Wow. Thank you. Well, all right. Uh, okay. I'm going to mute myself then. Very good, very good. Our next Our presenter, presenter is Martin, Martin Tucker. Tucker. All right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now, everyone? Am I yes, on? We can, we can hear you. It's just that everybody's muted, so you don't hear them. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, uh, well, first of all, thanks, uh, Lisa, and also uh, Fran, and I didn't say hello to Carol, so uh, I'll start off there. Uh, I'm going to read three poems. Uh, two of them are in my new book of poems that just came out a short while ago uh, called Reevaluations. I don't know if you can see it or not. Martin, can we it's, just ask you to tilt your screen a little so we can see you? Uh, yes. I think are it's you, your screen if, you tilt, if, if you're able to tilt the screen. Touch the screen. Tilt, tilt. Oh, tilt. Tilt so that you're... Or the opposite way, so that it's lowered and we see you. That's as far as my screen goes. Okay. Can you see me? Sort of. Do you want to, can you move your chair back just a little bit? There we go. Now we really see you. Now you can see me. Okay. Uh, uh, this is my new book of poems, uh, published just a sh uh, about a, two months ago, uh, Revaluations. And two of the poems I'm reading are from the book. Uh, the first one is Parkland, Florida, and it's dedicated uh, to the victims of the horrible massacre in Parkland High School, uh, Parkland, Florida. The tears that flow down the cheeks of a young woman listening to a poem written by a 17-year-old student on the day before he was murdered in Parkland, Florida, a uh, flow from the same stream of soul as mine. The father who spoke the poem without tears, holding at bay the flood that surely must have he must have harbored, was talking in the same spirit as mine. The tragedy owns all of us. We are one family overwhelmed. Yet the poem the son wrote speaks of a bicycle swift as wind across the grass a wave from writer to reader, handlebars to at command, driving into the brightness of sun. A dead boy's words give more than traction above the debris of his going. His lines shine with mightier, his lines shine mightier than hate in the wheel of a dream. I ride with him on a bicycle be spoke with love. And the second poem is Nature Symphony. Water falling from a counter in this kitchen preserve, bending its liquid drops to talk with the floor, surprised by the invading flow. Do I hear a colloquy between them, each element in a universe? ready for compromise, yet owing to the history of territorial use, size, excuse me. Touched by this meeting of polar natures, I raise my vision to a picture I drink from, a new life. This last poem is a long poem and I've been working on it for on and off for a number of years, and I worked on it yesterday, so that's why I'm reading it uh, today. And it's a takeoff or parody of A. E. Hausman's poem, This is Terence, This is Stupid Stuff. And uh, in the poem, Hausman, uh, using the persona of Terence, the Latin poet, uh, finds, uh, hears his reader scolding him because he writes uh, somber poetry, and they want a merrier verse, uh, a sunnier uh, kind of poetry. And he replies, using the persona, Hausman replies, using the persona of Terence, that his poetry uh, tells the truth soberly and cleanly, while 
if uh, people want merry poetry, they can go to a pub and drink and find, uh, well, the way Hausman puts it, uh, they can look into the pewter pot and find the world that's not. Uh, my poem is called Hausman's Lad, and it's two lines uh, underneath the title from Hausman. Ale man, ale's the stuff to drink for fellows whom it hurts to think. The problem with poor eyesight is not that you can't see a thing, but that the person you see is not the person you think you see. And after the issue is cleared and you've made your apology, he, she wants to keep on talking and go on talking till you exchange cards and say, it's been a fortuitous day, a small world, and do I really look like the person you said you were looking for? All that airy stuff until you think, is there going to be an ending to this beginning, which you never would have started if your eyesight was as good as it was 20 years ago? Then suddenly there is a gap in the talk and you jump over it and run to the next bar where you prepare to meet what, uh, where you prepare to forget what you started because you weren't wearing your glasses. And anyway, after the cataract operation, you'll need new glasses. The doctor tells you that. Save your money, the eyes have to settle down. You tell him, who ever heard of eyes settling down? Maybe a hard boiled eye, but that's thinking outside the shell. And now you're in the dim bar and you know you can't read the tab and the waiter is going to overcharge you so you'll leave him a bigger tip. And what the hell, life is short and the vision's going so you give the snotty waiter the 25% tip. That'll show him. And maybe he's a good guy, an actor trying to make it, whose nasty father sneers at his son what is wrong with being a banker? The waiter actor needs support. Well, you say, I didn't raise myself to lose my vision, and it's really hard growing old. I can't see uh, the candle in the window, the signal in the hill, all those things I saw when I was 40, but why cry over spilt milk when I can't see it? So you order another beer, that much you can see, and you promise yourself you'll wear your glasses the next time out, not the dark glasses, those fancy wraparounds you stacked in your pocket because it was sunlight when you started out. You might as well order another drink. You have to get through the day, you have to drive home, and maybe another drink will clear the air. You drink your last drink and think, I can't see a thing, but I know my way home. It's like swimming, I just float. But you know you shouldn't drive without glasses, so you walk home after all with yourself. It's only three miles down the road. The doctor said, you should walk more. It's good for your health. The next morning, you wake up feeling dim, and you wonder what happened to your yesterday was yesterday here. Meanwhile, you're trying to remember where you parked the car. It's Sunday, you say. I've got the whole day to think where I'm going. Like Hausman's Lad, a poem you read in school, you go back to bed forgetting you're a fool. Thank you. Uh, Mine is silent applause. Excuse me? Great. It's silent applause. Everybody applauded, yeah. but because they're muted, that's why oh. you couldn't hear it. <laughs> okay. So our next presenter is Carol Stone. Am I unmuted? 
Okay, could you unmute me? You are unmuted, Carol. Okay, okay, great, okay. All right, well, <clears throat> amongst the many repercussions of the coronavirus is, as you know, travel. And my husband and I have been going to Siwatanejo uh, every January and February. And right now we think maybe it's not such a good idea to go. So for nostalgic sake, I'm going to read some Mexican poems. Joy. The sea takes off its dress. I walk the beach holding a new language in my hands. Music glows from cantinas, history a mania left behind. The sigh of the child, pink as a dahlia. This is a village of Sunday melancholy, day of the dead joy. Love lingers in the palms, in the hibiscus, sighs, whispers, mi amor, mi corazón. I know you all know Frida Kahlo and are probably in love with her as much as I am. This poem is called Saint Frida. Your self-portrait with parrots adorns shopping bags. Camellias at your throat, you stare from postcards, your hair entangled in a headdress of leaves. From a 10 peso note, you and Diego smile. In a ruffled wedding dress, monkeys on your shoulders, your red mouth cries out, your eyes weep. Poor women pray to you for health, for money, for a good man. You've become a patron, patron saint, like the Virgin of Guadalupe. On restaurants, ladies' room doors, your eyebrows grow thicker each year. Ode to Maïs. Under green husks, you shine like the gold the conquistadores stole. Like flowers at dawn, you cast your scent, watch over the poor patron saint against hunger. Zapotec women grind your kernels between stones, make you in tor into tortillas to heal the wounds of conquest. I shook your ears, grill you, burnt around your edges, sometimes plunge you into water, boil you until your teeth are tender. I prick you with a fork, lift you from the pot, butter you, salt you, bite. Iguana on the bus. On the public bus to the town center, a man in an Armini tee, long hair and beard, holds a five-foot iguana on his lap. A maid in her black apron uniform on her way home from work leans over to pet its back. The black and gray iguana stiffens, bobs its head. The man slips a mango slice into its mouth, strokes the wrinkled body, speaks to the iguana as if it were his elderly parent. Its eyes are shut, its mouth silent, its jowls quiver. So that's Mexico, and I just thought I would go north for a moment. Um, Hadrian's Wall. I'm reading these poems, by the way, uh, because as a self-advertisement, I will be giving a travel poetry workshop at the Amagamset Library on Wednesday at 6 p.m. So if any of you want to come and try out your travel poems, please do. Hadrian's Wall. Rain falls on the farmer on his tractor, waving me away from the dirt road that leads to fields his family has owned for generations. Here in England's north, I'm an intruder, like the Romans, who for 300 years guarded this wall. I thought it would be huge, like their empire, but all that's left to show they were here are low-lying rocks. A public footpath sigh sign leads nowhere. Two black-eyed hues direct me to the hilltop. I maneuver my new boots th through their wet hoof tracks, thinking how the little soul Hadrian addressed held pale and alone. 
it took him as long to write his six line poem as to build his wall. And I'll just, just read one more. This is a short poem that I wrote when I was at the uh, Lavigny Writers uh, Retreat in Switzerland. There's the moon rising over the Rhone River, perfect and round as a pearl, like the diva explaining a moi, a kiss turned into a moon. Eau claire de la luna, Bizet's pearl fishers dive, hold their breaths. O teeth, O mouth, throbbing, O body, breathless, that used to burn. Our next presenter is D. Slahutin. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me just make sure I can switch to. Um, so that just seems like it is. Aging tree. In winter, you lure moonbeams to contorted limbs. Night's light exposes gnarled roots, yet you stand naked without shame. I see your stature. In spring, you lose a limb in heavy rain, burdened with mud, pink buds drown. You live with partial death thereafter. I see your wholeness. In summer, your green canopy crowns you, allows you to sway off your losses, claim your share of heaven's eternity. I see your majesty. In fall, you drop your guard, your, your flirtations finished, you preserve the bare essentials. I see your character. You have shown me the secret of your proud turnings. I have learned how the seasons train you. A yellow-eyed bird sleeps in your hollow. In my mirror, I want to own my wintering. Old love. Coffee cups and cereal bowls hold a half century of round conversations in a pale ancient light. Archaeologists scouring for the origins of true love will find traces of our peppermint tea and gluey spaghetti nights. A couple ambles down the street. Intrigued by the angle of her hip as it scrapes his leg, extending their rub like jazz notes, I believe they caress amid sips of velvet wine, then sleep entwined like we used to. Sometimes romance gets traded in, and identity gets walked off. Swaying hips lose their swagger, life gets less curvy, there are no keepsake whispers in heavy sleep. The diggers will find few jagged edges in our urns filled with grace poured with concrete strength. They won't find weapons. They'll discover us in a love song. Our quiet breath. Back then, I could no longer hear my voice. Its laconic echo lodged in black granite was a lonely universe with no shuttle. But somehow I traveled to you. Now we elope in the quiet of each other's breath while the pendulum eavesdrops, reminding time we are prone to fall in love. Flooded in a wordless world as though Noah remembered with each pair he intended love to drench us with its silence. Let's not allow our breath to fade. With you, there's no need to speak. Uterine Traveler. Migrating from a purple ovary, trailblazing beyond the passion that will make real my squeal. In a small yet limitless space, I somersault and flourish. There are no toothaches, I'm never hungry. This dark try-on room for souls is safe. Let me imbibe the saline nutrients in this tumbling, swimmable murk. A mitosis wind named Future is at my back. 
My feet want to touch the ground. My first thoughts are of freedom. Tell me I'm not dreaming. When I'm born in America, I could be someone, own a house one day, train a horse to ride in rodeo, save a mouse from drowning. The steer. The steer rises, his first rodeo. Never warned, he will be leashed, then unleashed until he snorts fire. The black, brown, and white of him finds an opening, backs in. He wants his mother. He will not find her again. Thrown to the ground, hooves quadrupled in ropes, foamed saliva, short snorts, a wild eye on the leather cowboy boot, trespassing on his neck. He doesn't know he's in a rodeo, there to please a crowd. Men with guns and spurs raised on extreme excitement, taught to witness suffering to impose it, then swagger, own the final say, raise a hat, squint into the sun and say, I win. And my last poem, send his body home. Perched on a rib cage, camouflaged by the open wound, the vulture's wings are blood tipped. His loud caw proclaims victory. Eyes, sentries protect something he knows he has not earned. The soldier's mother prays daily, but doubt infiltrates. Now she must beg God. His wife feeds their baby. She plumps his pillow, wears his slippers, reirons his shirts, searches for hints she can smell. A spider interrupts the vulture's dinner. It stops to decide which may be sweeter. Shifting positions, claws slip deeper into the dead. A mother, a child, a wife, a soldier, a bird, a spider, a war. Thank you. Our next presenter is Kate Rabinowitz. Hi. By the way, does everyone know you can just push the space bar to unmute? Ramesh and I will be uh, together, so we're going to use, I guess, what is it, five minutes or four minutes each? <laughs> So uh, we're first going to show, just wait, wait, wait. We're, we're going to show a film of one of the projects we're doing with Anna's Foundation, which we did with the Shinnecock, um, some people from the Shinnecock tribe and in the Southampton schools. And then we're going to do a little travel essay um, with Anna. So this is an experiment. We're going to share the screen, I hope. Let's see if this goes. Are you on, on mute? Yeah. Are you seeing the screen, Chair? No. Okay. Not yet. The host has to enable the uh, screen, screen share. Sharing. Oh, okay. Hang on to then. Hang on a second. Uh, it will all screen. Sh no, hang on. I got it. I got it. Okay. Try it now. It's not. Up. Are you seeing it? Not yet. No, wait. No, it's not working. It's not working. Ramesh. Are you seeing this, the uh, screen share? No. Okay. We'll go back. Are you, are you, are you on? I don't your think you put it on screen share. Ramesh. I did. How about that share up at the right? All right, here it goes. I think we got it now. Yeah, okay. All right. How about that? No. Uh, we try screen two. We just see you. Oh, there it is. We got it. Oh, there we okay. go. There, there, there. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we got it. Now they can see it. Yeah. 
and we can see them watch it. <laughs> Can't hear. Can you turn up the volume, Ramesh? It's up about as high as it goes. In the screen sharing app, is there something with volume on the green? Wait, 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 just see if there's a oh, look at more, look at more and see if there's volume. Kate, should there be sound with this? Yeah. Yes. Just turn it off for a second. There is sound, but um, but it's very, it's not very uh, loud. Don't play it again. Um, we've turned it up all we can and everything. So um, if if nobody can hear, I think we should just um. Can, right. you, can you describe? It. Can you describe the video? Can you explain yeah. what's going on? You want to describe it, Ramesh? Just um, just leave it. We're, we're done. <laughs> you want to describe or you want me to? I'm going to stop screen sharing. For me. Um, we had a project you know we've been doing this photography program and this was for the kids to work with this uh, Shinnecock artist uh, Jeremy Dennis who does these pretty amazing kind of um, collage montage expression his own work is these really amazing photography montages so he kind of inspired the kids how to do that and it was uh, Native American month so they were We can't hear you, Kate. Wait, hang on, Ramesh. Wait. You're muted. Wait, I'm trying to unmute him. Oh. Okay, wait. You got muted there for a second, Kate. Can you? Say, can you just back up a bit? Oh no, you still, wait, Ramesh keeps turning on mute, hang on.
Can they unmute themselves? I think, Ramesh, did you maybe turn the volume down on your microphone or something? Do you have an external mic hooked up? Because we can't hear you at all now. And, and you're not muted. I didn't hear that either. I'm, I'm just going to just write the chat. Just go to the next person. Okay, we'll come back to, to the you. Next person. Hear you. We'll now come we back to you. We'll return to you. Yeah. Right. We're, Bill, good. Just, just turn off. Just let's just get off and start on again. Let's get off the whole thing. Okay. Let's oh no! Wait, we on. hear you. Wait, wait. You're back. Yeah, right. Wait, you're back. Wait, hang on. Wait. <laughs> By the way, um, Butch, you'll be interested. I'm, I'm taking some screenshots and trying to, I'm trying to record this whole thing. So for posterity. But you're muted too. Wait, he's muted too. Okay, who's next? Bill Good. Bill Good. Okay, I just unmuted myself. Um, some of you know me and some don't, so i just give a quick introduction. Uh, my family had built a home in Barnes Landing in 1960 uh, at the corner of Captain's Walk in Windward. Uh, it was 18 Captain's Walk. And uh, a home we had for over 50 years. I sold it in 2013. And I relocated to Brunswick, Maine. As I mentioned earlier, it's about 30 miles up the coast from uh, Portland. In any event, uh, I'm going to read a history of Barnes Landing that I wrote about 12 years ago. I should say an edited version. Um, and um, I had written this in part because I began a welcome letter program uh, to welcome new homeowners to the community, which I turned over to Herb uh, when I left uh, Barnes Landing back around 2013. Any event, uh, it's called Barnes Landing, a history. Barnes Landing. Can you hear me now, perchance? Uh, yes, okay. yes. Well, we that's good. Now. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we can do anything about the uh, it works. Uh, the video gonna... sound. So, uh, Ramesh, we'll let that Ramesh, one go. Uh, we Ramesh, were can do you do a little Ramesh. slideshow? But I think uh, Ramesh. We'll, well, Ramesh uh, can't hear us. We'll try that either. This was a little too advanced well, he... for Wait. our uh, Ramesh. Can you hear us? Capabilities right no. now. No, Ramesh. Okay. So, what, can, can uh, Bill, thanks for okay? uh, watching. Bill anyway, if you he's want he's to uh, hear the hear soundtrack, us. it's on the uh, Anna Mirabai Foundation uh, site. Anna Mirabai Lytton Foundation. Ramesh, can you hear us? Dot org. Ramesh. So Fran, sorry let's about the uh, technical experiment. Which, I was uh, going to tell him to send us the link in work. the chat. Just let him, let him do his thing, I think, because like, he can't hear us. Okay, sorry, Bill. Okay, no problem. Okay, Ramesh, go for it. I, I don't know why he can't hear us. Ramesh. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, but can you hear us? Now I can, yeah. Okay, so wait, so Bill Good was going to read his history of Barnes Landing, and then can we come back to you? Uh, well, yeah, I don't think we're gonna get the sound on the video, so. Um, um, well, that's all right, you know what, you can, if you can send a message in the chat to everybody, you can send a link or you can send it through email and then we can all watch it later. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Okay, Bill, Bill, you go. Ro okay. Roll it out of the park. Okay. <laughs> go okay. for it, Bill. I'm going mute again. Okay, I think I'm going now. Um, and I'll, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this history of Barnes Landing and I used to send out in the welcome letters so if anyone is interested in it, I'll give you my email address at the end. So I, you can just email me and I can send you a copy. Uh, Barnes Landing, also known historically as Barnes Hole, is in the hamlet of the Springs. The name The Springs comes from the freshwater springs at the head of Akabonic Harbor. 
Barnes Hole was first mentioned in 1716 in the diary of a New London, Connecticut resident who made frequent trips by boat to the east end of Long Island to visit relatives and do business. The name Barnes possibly came from Isaac Barnes, who was born in East Hampton in 1677. He was one of the four founders of Amagansett, settling there around 1700. Isaac Barnes was a brickmaker. Brickmaking was an early local history. Brick, the bricks were made from gray Gardner's Island clay and red Amagansett clay. Along the Pominock Path in the Bell Estate in Amagansett, there is evidence today of the open clay pits that were mined. Woodcutting was another local industry. Cord wood would be cut for firing the local brick kilns. The wood was also used as firewood to heat homes locally and as far away as New England and New York City, where it would be shipped by boat. Barnes Landing was clear cut of its wood several times over the past couple of centuries since the land was not suitable for other uses. Seaweed was another resource that was harvested from the shoreline, particularly after an easterly gale. Wagon loads of seaweed would be handed off, uh, would be hauled off the beaches to be used as insulation in local homes, as bedding for farm animals, and as fertilizer on farm fields and home gardens. Another, another local industry that continues today is fishing. A handful of commercial boats are moored in Akabonic Harbor near the launching ramp off Louse Point Road. The word Akabonic is derived from the Indian expression for the place where groundnuts grow, tubers like potatoes, which the Indians boiled and consumed. Bonica, a designation used to describe an East Hampton native, comes from the name Akabonic. The word Bonica originally meant a person who lived by or close to Akabonic Harbor. The earliest home in Barnes Landing that still exists today is the one and three quarter story house at 96 Barnes Hole Road and was reportedly built in the early 1800s. At the fork in the road formed by Barnes Hole Road and Old Stone Highway is a one and a half story house dating from 1835, which has had alterations over the years. Some of the earliest summer homes uh, in the springs were built close together in Barnes Landing uh, in what was known as the Ross family compound, where Ramesh Das and Kate Rabin Rabinowitz live today. There were three homes built between 1910 and 1920. The homes are accessed by private driveways from Barnes Hole Road and Shoreridge. Uh, they are not visible from the public road. Another building that predates the Barnes Landing development is St. Peter's Chapel on Old Stone Highway near Chapel Lane. Originally known as the East Side Free Chapel, it was constructed in 1881 and was non-denominational. The chapel became affiliated with St. Luke's Church of East Hampton in the early 1900s when it was given its present name. On summer Saturday evenings, you can still hear the original bell chime in the open belfry announcing the start of services. But you won't see an AT&T cell tower as you, if you saw Herb's email earlier today. It was in 1907 that a pioneer Suffolk County real estate developer from Northport, Long Island, named William B. Codling, assembled parcels of land that eventually became the Barnes Landing de Development. He was one of the largest landowners in the town of East Hampton, as well as Suffolk County. He died in 1924 in Huntington, Long Island, after having been struck by an automobile. He left his wife and two children, William and Helen. It was Helen Codling Halstead who would develop Barnes Landing from 1952 through the 1960s. In honor of her father, William B. Codling, a horse and buggy was adopted as a symbol of the Barnes Landing Association, since it was, his, uh, since it was an early mode of transportation when viewing his properties, including Barnes Landing. It was in 1952 that Mrs. Halstead built the single room building at the northeast corner of Water's Edge and Barnes Hole Road to serve as her real estate office. She deeded the building to the Barnes Landing Association for a meeting house. Mrs. Halstead died in 1968. The Barnes Landing Association was formed in 1958 and is a community of approximately 250 property owners uh, on 220 acres. Mrs. Halstead also deeded to the association the private parking lot on Beach Way, 
the scenic Gardner's Bay overlook at the corner of Water's Edge and Captain's Walk, and a 1.6 acre parcel on Akabana Harbor. In the early days of the development, this parcel was advertised as a future marina for residents of Barnes Landing, a plan that was never acted upon. Today, it is home to a, a seasonal nesting pair of osprey. You can see the osprey nest on a platform atop a pole on the parcel along Louse Point Road opposite Lookout Lane. And that's it. And for my email address, you can uh, request a copy of the history at at uh, fairwind500 at gmail.com. Fairwind500 at gmail.com. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Our next presenter will be Fran Kasten. Can you hear me? Do I need to be uh, full screen or something? No? Am I full screen? No. You are full screen. Okay, good. All right. Um, I want to thank you so much for doing this again. And um, thank you, Bill. That was fascinating to me. I, I didn't know a lot of that history. My first visit to Barnes Landing as a renter was in 1968. And I had just come back from living in Hong Kong uh, I'd come back with my little daughter, and it was after a, a tragedy in my own life. My first husband was killed in Vietnam as a journalist, and uh, this was my foray out into the world, and I couldn't believe the beach. I couldn't believe anything that beautiful was so close to where I was born in Brooklyn, just a hundred miles away, and here I'd been all around the, the world, and I thought, oh, these beaches are so beautiful. And the most beautiful one was right, right here. And then uh, in the 70s, uh, my second husband and I bought property there. And it was the last place that I lived before moving to the, the North Fork. So I'm going to write to Fairwind 500 as soon as I can. And thank you for that. Um, the first poem I'm going to read, which is a completely different thought process, um, is called Crohn's Pedicure. And um, you have to think of Crohn's or Crone, not in the current uh, thought of it as a, a hag, a witch, or a, an ugly old, mean old woman, and uh, think back to its origins from the word crown, which was what was imagined on the heads of older women, their wisdom. They were kind of leading the way. They, they were through with their reproductive life and all the power that went into generation uh, was now used for discovering the self and, and doing other things. The intro was longer than the poem. Here it is. Crohn's Pedicure. May this terracotta glaze attract a lover as if I were still fecund as earth, a girl in open-toed shoes whose hips mean I do. Menstrual blood no longer weeps on a white sheet, but these drops of polish startling on pale feet draw the mind away from I don't. Wet and rich as loam, painted nails make me hope. Let this dance on the tips of my toes begin to the rhythm of live, live, do not give in. And uh, let me think. I'm going to move all over this, shorten this reading. Um, last spring, I went uh, to the UK to pick up a little prize for a poem from the Hippocrates Society. And they're a society uh, that believes medicine and poetry work really well together. And uh, they use poetry to help heal and um, to help people who treat patients to have compassion, to have a narrative ability. So um, this poem has nothing to do with, <laughs> with those lofty ideas. Um, it was written after I had shingles, and I don't know if any of you have ever had this horrible thing, but it's very, very painful. Um, and it comes from 
something called zoster, which uh, gives us chicken pox in childhood and lives on in our bodies to erupt again as shingles. Now, fortunately, there's a vaccine, so take it if you haven't already. And I decided when I wrote this to scream and yell at this thing because it was so mean to me. So it's called to zoster. Pox that you are. Wasn't it enough to define itch in childhood, etch your way across my face, threaten to scar it? Must you return in old age a scourge? What did you do all day for years, 50 of them? Menace, did you wrest your favorite food from the feast of my body? Did you change the way I felt or moved? What else dwells with you? Am I a protective shell for who knows how many other nasty strangers? Terrorist, why, after your dormancy, after allowing whatever beauty is mine to prevail, did you wake up and send a platoon of flamethrowers on a sortie to ignite my scalp, which smoldered and burned for days before it blistered? Insurgent. You tunnel inside a network of nerves until you emerge and conquer. What lullaby will lull you back to sleep and let me be whatever being me means now that I must forever include you among the other collaborators? Um, a little bit of a more benevolent connection to nature and natural objects. This is called waking up. When I stretch my legs between the sheets and lift my arms over the rise of the pillow, I think of the octopus. I do. She straightens her supple arms all the way to their curving tips, enlivening the very limits of herself. Even in repose, she is vivid, exuding new color, new texture. Next to coral, she resembles coral. Whatever her disguise, she resides in a radiant center where one brain and three hearts dwell together. And help me imagine it's possible to think with a heart. When I reach out like the octopus all the way to the tips of my limbs, my tingling toes and fingers remind me there is more of me than I use to know myself and the world that eases around me, the way water surrounds its creatures, buoys them, and sets them free. And this poem, um, is in memory of my late husband, uh, Louis Axe, who was a painter. Um, and it was written shortly after he died and has that feeling of current grief, uh, which is an understandable thing. It's called After the Last Kiss. Now that my mate has died, my body no longer has eyes to see its loveliness. It has no mouth to arouse it or give it comfort. It has no skin for its skin, so it takes its own hands, my hands, as if this small pair could duplicate his, places them just above my breasts, draws them away from each other toward my shoulders like a masseuse. But I am not soothed wherever I go, to a small gathering of friends or a stadium full of strangers, I search for him, though I'll never find him, the way we found each other once and became a single body, only death could part. Fortunately, and what allows us to keep going, and that's a five-year-old experience, um, our memories return to happier times, what we've cherished. And one of my favorite uh, memories, many of them, have to do with being in Venice with Lou uh, for two extended trips where we painted and we wrote. Um, 
with friends who were running the Pratt and Venice program, an art program there. And uh, during that time, we just had the happiest period of doing art during the day and going to see more in the evenings. And there were concerts um, every night in churches on, on street corners and squares and so on. And one of the ones that is totally memorable to me uh, was going to Vivaldi's church, as it's locally known, where he um, taught girls from an orphanage nearby on instruments that today are 300 years old and they were still being used and played on. And I couldn't get over that I was listening to music on instruments that he used to teach. So this is Vivaldi Concerti. And you may know this one, but one other thing is that around the time this poem was written, um, the people who study this kind of thing, archeologists found a wing bone hollowed out uh, it was 60,000 years old, and they determined that it was the oldest instrument of its type that people that preceded us played. So it's all in here. Vivaldi Concerti. There are so many birds in Vivaldi. Once he heard them, he had to have them. He seized what the earth offered and gave everything back. Tonight, a snow bunting calls from the, wind, sorry, from the woodwinds, soloist in camouflage, white dress shirt, black tailcoat, a piccolo for a beak. Like the first to blow song through a wing bone, he longs to soar and Vivaldi lifts him, lifts him so lightly, each bird sings again. The peak, the dive, the aerial glide, we all unfold our shouldered wings and fly. And now for my last poem, um, it's called Sailing. And it was written from one of my five grandchildren when he was uh, under two and he's now 21, but it's for all five of them, ranging in age from 25, which I never thought I'd live to see, to 17. So here we have sailing. If it weren't for the trees, there are times we would not notice the life of air. We'd forget we are whirling. In the afternoon, my grandson sees the half moon in a sky blue sky, alive with foamy clouds. Having spent only 19 months on earth with unblemished freshness and no linguistic bias, he points to that brilliant mass afloat in the blue and says, boat! I want to lift the sails, the battened years of seeing. I want to shout boat at the moon. I want to remember our moon boat, to recognize at every moment, even at a desk, paying bills, even when the wind is still and earth seems unplanetary, we are sailors of the Milky Way, waving our spangled arms to all who travel the universe. And our next presenter is Niels Brun. now okay i can you can hear me I'm gonna, yes. but can you see me i can't hear you we can uh, see and hear you we can what? see and hear you yes can you hear me now yes okay can you give me the screen each person does that individually Oh, I, what do I do? 
You don't have to do anything. Each person can go into the corner of their screen and make you a whole screen without you doing anything. Okay. You're uh, but do I, can I do that too? Uh, on, yours, on yours, yes, you may. If you look, if you look in the corner, you'll see, you'll see that you have options as to how you view the event, the phone, the, the Zoom. Oh, you want me to, oh, this, oh, I can do this, this is, this is. Each person does it only for themselves. No, here, I got the gallery view and I can't, I can't figure out if how to you, get. If you go over, if you go to gallery view and you click on it, it should switch to speaker view. Oh, there, but, but I'm not, I, it doesn't do it. It, oh, it gets speaker view, but it gives me you, Oh, that's not me. because I'm talking. That's because. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking now and it's well, still not doing anything. But for us, we see you as, as a full screen. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit. This is a piece I did a few years ago. Um, as you can see, it's on, on the wall behind me um, back there. Um, it's um, nine pieces. Uh, grid and uh, three by three. I um, I just, uh, one of the things that's interesting about it, I'll show you a, a close up of one of these. Um, this is somewhat, this is what, this is what this, what one of them looks like. Um, and they're all different. Um, some of them, there's nine different patterns of folded paper. Uh, they are, uh, let me get this out of the way. Um, and they're, they're actually only five different pieces. This piece and this piece are the, op, are the back side, are flip side of each other. And this piece and this piece are the flip side. And so the diagonals and, and the one's opposite corner and opposite sides are the flip side of the, other, of, of, of the same piece. Just obviously different, different color paper. But uh, I've been doing this for, for quite a lot while, and it's, this is like, I've got some other pieces, but I can't really show them to you. It's hard to walk this computer around the room um, or around the house. So um, that's, that's, what I, that's what I do, and that's what you can look at. And any questions, I'd be glad to hear them. I, I can answer questions, or, or we can just, go on and go to the next one. I don't have a lot more to say about it. Okay. Thank you. Now my wife is going to be next, I think. I'll let you go, honey. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, I am uh, in Barnes Landing. I think I'm known as Nils's wife, but I actually have my own name, which is Alina. Uh, and I am um, not a writer. I've always said that. And, uh, but I've been taking some lessons. And I just want to say that I have tremendous admiration for poets because there's so much music in, in poetry and I'm basically a music person at the end of the day. But unfortunately, sadly, I can only write in prose. So here goes, I hope it's not a thud. Okay, um, it's called, uh, it's, I've been writing blogs lately. I'm also a, a psychotherapist and I put blogs up on my uh, website. Okay, this one is called Coronavirus. It was written on April 13th, 2020. And it starts off, Dear Abby, suddenly it seems I get it. I'm dead serious. I rushed to buy paper towels and toilet paper, <clears throat> said to be already running out in the supermarkets. We order food in bulk, not daring to go out except for precious exercise. We walk 
on the beach, uh, but not much because it's still the dead of winter. We order food and, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the pools are closed. It is freezing outside. No time of year to swim at the beach or bay. Normally, swimming is what keeps me sane. In our East Hampton self-imposed quarantine, in my most depressed moments, I am a caterpillar in a rotting cocoon. Among those, I am among those lost children about to drown in a deep cave in Thailand. And I find myself recalling the feeling I had on first reading the diary of Anne Frank. Like Anne, I was 13 or 14 years old at the time, and so was my vivid imagination. I could picture myself in Amsterdam with my family hiding from the Nazis. Will Meep, the Good Samaritan, be able to bring us food today? Will Peter, the boy in the family hiding with us, ever notice me? Will we be caught? Will I ever see another butterfly? I know, I know, I'm in America, it's 2020, it's bad here, given the state of our union, but still, it's not the same. The coronavirus is not personal as it was with the Nazis. I can go outside, walk on the beach, have a good dinner. You can't compare, some friends say. Some friends said they thought it was outrageous to try. But there are parallels. I'm Jewish. Anti-Semitism is on the rise, along with every other imaginable prejudice. We have a power-mad president, and I'm old. I've lived out my life, life expectancy. I'm no longer of use. I'm expendable. It feels personal. And there's more, too. I was born in 1940, right at the start of World War II, smack in the middle of Manhattan. A photo taken by my uncle of me at a year and a half reveals a sensitive, sad, impressionable child. The thinking was that if the United States was going to be attacked by Germany, New York City might be the first ta target. My father was an air raid warden. My mother said it was an important job. I heard loud, scary sirens at night, and we ran to quickly turn off all the lights. I can still hear those sirens in my mind if I concentrate though they've been silent for, is it 75 years? I can still remember looking out the window, watching the city go dark. I had no, not, no idea an air raid was only a rehearsal. All I know is I was petrified like Anne. The Nazis were somewhere in my consciousness toward the end of the war when I was five, but even then they weren't real to me. I can still sense mis uh, that mysterious, threatening presence, like robbers or a snake under my bed, ready to strike with no notice, like coronavirus today. Today, of course, I know the Nazis were real, proving beyond a doubt that our, our capacity to inflict pain, our inhumanity knows no bounds, Arguably, the coronavirus is impersonal. It only happens to prefer the elderly, that's all. These thoughts run through my head, ending with, so who are you to compare her situation to yours, yourself to Anne Frank? And maybe I shouldn't, but then it's not about reason, it's about feelings. I feel vulnerable, I am vulnerable. That's the word, vulnerable, just like when I was a little girl when all the grown-ups around me were scared. My parents, my Aunt Hannah, my Aunt Gussie. Sac sacrilegious, maybe, but I claim my right to feel like Anne. And having just reread her diary, I doubt she would mind. Anne wrote her diary to an un unknown friend like I wrote to Dear Abby. Dear Kitty is how she began every installment. Maybe she thought that friendship would save her. Finally, though, at the end of the day, I must yield, concede that Anne, a young girl with all the promise in the world, is gone while I am still here. And if I die in this pandemic, it will not be a tragedy. I have been lucky in so many ways. Now I need to get a grip, a way to be positive. Okay, I've got it. 
this can't go on forever, and maybe I and we, unlike Anne and her family, will survive. Spring is in the air. It's mid-March. I have my husband to confer converse with, argue with, walk on the beach with, hug, my tall, handsome Dane. It probably won't wipe us out financially. It is not yet a hardship. <clears throat> a friend of my younger son insists on delivering food. My older son and daughter-in-law too. The snowdrops and the crocuses are out. I saw my older son yesterday with his wife and two children. Yes, six feet apart. But Cricket, their brilliant, beautiful, loving rescue dog from ARF, ran back and forth between us, jumping up, licking our faces, delirious that we were all there on the beach together. That's it. Thanks to uh, the organizers, Francine and Lisa, and also to Ramesh and Kate for you know, starting this wonderful event. Oh, wait, I think uh, we got Ramesh. Uh, Ramesh oh, right. still has a presentation. Good. Lisa? Yeah, Ramesh, oh. would, would you like to present Ramesh? Wait, let me unmute you. Well, we can give it a try. Uh, I will uh, provide the audio on this one. This is just uh, a quick uh, slideshow from uh, a trip we did to Italy. Uh, let's see if I can make this one work. We're experimenting in, uh, let's see, okay. <coughs> it's working. You see pictures? We see, uh, we see uh, all the snaps, you know, all the thumbnails. Okay, so these are Anna's uh, photographs from Italy when she was 13, or 12, actually. If you have to open up the slides, we're, we're, seeing, the, we're seeing the thumbnails right now. Oh, okay. Um, I think uh, you should be seeing the slides now. No? Well, all right. Well, we'll then, then, we're not, and then you're not on the... Um, I mean, we're still seeing the menu, like the visual menu. All right, just now coming. You might have to go to another window. Look, look behind, look behind the, the window of the thumbnails, Ramesh. Yeah. Okay, now, okay, that's right. Now click that's the, the thumbnails. Slideshow. Right, so click, click to your left on the slideshow itself. Like on the menu, yeah. Okay, try that. That'll work. Do you see the big screen now? No. no do you? Yeah, well, I then do. You click away. We're still seeing the. Uh, the small All right. Let me see if I can get the other screen here. One second. You did great. You did too. Yeah. That was real awkward. Well, Mesh, click, go, go off to the menu and click on Anna Italy and double click on that. And then say open. You're, you're, you, do you see you're in the manage picture tools right now? Do you see at your top menu, you're in manage picture, you're not in just open and view? Yeah. Well, I, I was. All right, one sec. Let's try this again. How's that? Yep, that's it. Okay. This, this is Milan, the Duomo. We went, flew into Milan and uh, took the tour at Il Duomo and uh, got up on the roof of the cathedral, which was kind of fun. It was a good adventure. This is kind of fun contrast between the old and new of Milan. And uh, Anna was quite fascinated by all the patterns and things that were coming along there. Um, and then we were out in gardens, parks, and then we went from Milan to Venice. We were there for 
four or five days. We really had quite a good tour. She had kind of a nice uh, eye for texture and uh, juxtapositions. And it was quite fun seeing all of the a new seascape. Uh, and then we went from uh, Milan to uh, Florence. Oh, this was still Venice, I guess. Uh, we had uh, quite a uh, wonderful uh, tour of the Peggy Guggenheim uh, gallery there too, which was wonderful. I don't think it's this crowded now. <laughs> we went out to the uh, um, glass blowing island. This was a Beautiful. Beautiful. She's such a good photographer. Yeah, she has a good eye. And she wrote beautifully, too. She was, was really going to read some of her poems, but I think we've lost that part. So just keep going. This was the glass blowing on the, on the island. Is that Murano, the Murano company? Yeah, it's Murano and uh, there are two islands where they do the glass blowing. Murano was one of them. Pretty good for drain pipes anyway. Yeah. I guess we could paint up our neighborhood a little bit, but it doesn't work with <laughs> shingles so well. And we went up to uh, Assisi for a few days, which was uh, really unusual. And there was a, a woman we had met in India who was, uh, uh, has a retreat center there. Uh, we didn't stay there, but we saw her. And um, she actually uh, runs a uh, yoga center. This is Giovanna. Quite wonderful Italian woman. I don't know if she's still alive now. And that was uh, coming back across our cattle guard, coming home. Okay, so that was the screen share, and that's the. Uh, <laughs> and a slideshow. Thank you. Beautiful. So I want to thank everybody for presenting. And before I present, I would just like to talk a little bit about how much this event means to me and how deeply grateful I am to all of you for participating. We've been doing this together for 19 years. And uh, I remember our big, many people here were with us right from the start. So it's so moving to me that we've gone through, we've gone through an awful lot of life events together. Well, most of us are in a very different place now than we were 19 years ago. I'm so glad that now our event is named for Anna. I'm always awed by the beauty of her work, of her writing, of her artwork. And to think that she was so young and yet had such deep insight is amazing. It's amazing. When we started this event, it was really, uh, it was really a local affair. Ramesh, do you remember those early meetings about it? 
Mm-hmm. See, and when we did the first few years, we did it in our Aunt Mary and Uncle Eddie's house in on Water's Edge, and it was really Hero and I worked together and organizing the participants of it. And I remember that my sister Mora, who's here with us today, and my dad, who's no longer with us, helping us to set up chairs and plates and buy snacks and everybody, my mom helped, she's no longer with us anymore. Everybody chipped in. I just, I'm looking at this list of readers with so many of you, we've been reading for 19 years together. Martin Tucker, Bill Good, Ramesh, Fran Kasten, uh, D.H. Mellon, who's no longer with us, read with us for years. Car Did I say Carol Stone? She's been a cornerstone of our reading for ever. <laughs> it's, it's a very wonderful thing that no matter how much we've gone through and not all of it's so wonderful, we've come together each year again. I want to thank Bill Good for having been the person to have the idea of combining it with the cocktail party and doing it at the meeting house. First, we did it at our house, then we did it at the church. What was the name of the church? Around oh, St. Peter's Chapel. It was the little church there. We must and we also it. did it up at uh, Ted and... Um, yep, Klopman. Yeah, at Ted Klopman's uh, house. And what, what was her... She participated with us. What... What was her first name? Uh, started with an R. Anyway, that's, see, I have developed Alzheimer's between them. <laughs> Roberta. Roberta, yeah. Roberta, Roberta. And that's right, we did it at their house for a couple of years. And I think we really found our stride when we started meeting at the meeting house. And now Francine saved us for another year. And here we are on Zoom. Uh, I want to... Also mentioned that Butch and Ramesh have been taking pictures of all of us, of all of the readers and of our group picture for all these years. I think Butch is with us. Are you here, Butch? Yeah. Butch, you should do a retrospective one of these days. Butch, yeah. Zoom is a good medium for it. There's Butch. Butch has recorded us for all of eternity. And he and Ramesh have both taken our picture many times for the local newspapers. And we've, we're published almost every year. We get a big spread in the East Hampton Star and in, um, in the East Hampton, what, what, is, what is it, Ramesh, the East Hampton Press? Press. Yeah. They cover us all the time. I mean, we, we get in both before the reading and after the reading. So all together we've become kind of a group institution. Although as a famous actress once said, I don't know if I'm ready yet for an institution. So thank you, everybody. And um, I'd like to read a piece called She Made a Difference. Uh, it's a fictional piece, and it's based on Morris and my mom and Beth's grandma. In the high school where Ellen taught, third period was about to begin. She had two minutes to prepare for her next class of 34 students. <clears throat> Suddenly, from the bottom drawer on the teacher's desk came the ring of her cell phone. Ma, huh? is this an emergency? No, everything's fine. I'm busy. You're always busy. Busy, busy, busy. I'll make it fast. Why don't you want me to move in with you? Neither you nor your sister want me to live with you. It's not that we don't want you to live with us. Then I'll come over tonight. We've gone over this a hundred times before. Well, let's go over it a hundred and one times. You know I have no memory anymore. Oh, what's going on in my brain, Ellen? It happened to my aunts and it happened to my mother who didn't even know who I was at the end. And now it's come down to me. Mom, give the phone to Barbara. Barbara? Ellen whispered urgently into the static. Are you there? Hello, Ellen, said Barbara, the caregiver. We have an officer of the law here with us. Why? Your mother was yelling at me so loudly that the neighbors called security. The, author is, the officer is saying she needs to take your mother to the hospital. She's sick? I'll let you speak with the officer directly. Before turning the phone over to the officer, Barbara whispered into the mouthpiece, your mom just hit the officer with her walker. Officer, Ellen asked, hello, this is Officer Bradley. Are you the daughter? I'll need to take her over to Cabrini Hospital. Why? She has fired the caregiver and refuses to stay with her until you arrive home today. Officer, my mother can't be taken to Cabrini. 
As we know, Alzheimer's patients can become disoriented in an unfamiliar setting, and they can panic and become delirious. I do understand this, but legally, if she refuses to stay with her caregiver, I'll have no choice but to take her to a facility. I'm so sorry she hit you. She's a feisty woman. I admire her. Are you the one who made that poster of her accomplishments with her and taped it to her closet door? Yes, officer. The officer began to read off the list. I see, Dr. Feinberg Steinberg, said the officer. You are a founding member of the National Organization of Women, appointed by Betty Friedan to be national coordinator of the task force on child care. Stop, mom cried. I don't want to talk about it. Who cares? That's someone else's life. Doesn't anybody want to know me? Look at me. This is me. Ellen spoke up. Thank you, officer. May I speak with my mother now? Sure, I'll give her the phone, said the officer. Mom, asked Ellen, do you hear? You helped to change the world. Remember what you told me you wanted your tombstone to say? She made a difference. Come home from school now, Ellen. Mom. Do you realize that you are telling me, your flesh and blood, that I should leave my job outside the home to return to my domestic duties? There was a long pause. I'll stay with Barbara for now, if Barbara will stay with me, but only so that you can work. Let it never be said that I wouldn't support a woman's right to work and earn an independent living. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Marvelous. So wonderful. Beautiful. <laughs> so I think I think that's it. If there's anybody on Zoom right now who would like to participate with us next year, we would love to have you. If you might just send me uh, your information. Francine, how do I type it to everybody? Um, um, you have to go to the, you have to go to chat. You have to open the chat window. I'm in chat. I'm in chat, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you private. Oh, I see. Send to everyone. Here we go. Send to everyone. Yeah. And everybody, I, I unmuted everybody. Uh, okay. so people want to say thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It. To go. Thank you so much. So much. Thanks, Jerry. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good to see you all, even on uh, the computer screen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, I remember. It's wonderful to see your faces, Lisa. I think I think maybe uh, just send the. Um, I've actually been recording this. Oh. Uh, yeah. So. Um, do you see my? Do you see my email at the bottom? Oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Let me. Say that again. Oh, sure. Sure. He's muted. I muted. I muted. Okay. okay. See, I sent my email at the bottom of the screen to everybody, the chat, so that anybody who would like to participate with us next year, who may not have been participating already this year, can see it. Okay, but a lot of Awano at gmail .com. Yeah, a bunch of people left. Oh, uh, it's been there for a while. Yeah. I actually don't see it, but. Oh, you don't, it says to everyone. Oh gosh, did I not hit? I don't think you hit send. I Maybe she did, we got it, we have it. You got it? All right, good. Okay, bye okay, everybody. Well, I'll, bye. I'll let you know how the uh, recording comes out. Wonderful. Thank you okay. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.